Good afternoon. How are we today? Yeah. Awesome. Glad to hear it. Very happy to hear that. Uh, thank you, Nasia, for the nice introduction. And, uh, and a big thank you to, to Alex and the entire Startup Grind team for putting on another uh, amazing event here in Barcelona. Uh, I'm joined here with, uh, well, let's see here. I'm joined here with um, Shruti Chindalor. You guys had just the intro from Nasia, um, the basically managing director of all of EMEA uh, for Criteo, one of the fastest growing companies in the world and, and listed on the NASDAQ exchange, uh, as well as Juan, uh, the, the CEO and co-founder of Marfil. Um, I think a good place to start here is to maybe let you guys give a quick introduction and, and how you got to where you are today, uh, so we have some context for the final talk uh, of today's, today's session. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. ladies first, I guess. Um, so I fell into sales to start with. We're talking about sales, so that's how I did fall into sales. My dad was um, a head of sales for a long time, and it was something that excited me from from the very beginning, and I was sure I wanted to try it out. It was very exciting, uh, even though I tried being a programmer at some stage. Uh, love tech um, and sales. The best thing you can do is uh, sell technology. So my first tech sales job was in Oracle. Started in business development, a um, lot of different roles, starting up a lot of different teams within the big company like Oracle. And then LinkedIn happened. Um, fantastic company to work for, by the way. And then uh, I was approached by Critio after three years in LinkedIn, and it ticked a lot of boxes. Um, Critio is a special company with amazing people. And we are roughly about 380 people in uh, Barcelona. And yeah, here I am. Yeah. And, and she's fairly new to Barcelona, 11 months yes. in, right? Oh, year, uh, give or take. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but very exciting things on the, on the horizon for Critio, and we'll dive into some of that as well. Uh, Juan, tell us about yourself. So, um, I'm a civil engineer by education, and I started, so I worked for like six, seven years at a multinational real estate company, but mm -hmm. I didn't really like it, you know, so it mostly it was about any new idea I had, it was like, oh, no, London wouldn't let us do that, oh, no, Chicago would not like this, whatever, right, so I thought, I want to do my own things, right, and I decided to take an MBA, so I started here, I decided, um, I took a part-time MBA, mm -hmm. and then when I finished, I, I started my first company that was back in 2006, it was called Bongo, um, it was one of the, um, well, it was the first um, gift experience, uh, gift box experience company wow. in Spain. Yeah. Ahead of your time. <laughs> in a way, in a way, yeah, 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 and there weren't events like this back then, so I didn't know how to do it or whatever, and even, yeah, I had taken my MBA, but maybe I forgot attending some of my classes because I didn't have... A shareholders agreement, right? So at some point, my, my partners, they sold their shares to one of our competitors in France, so I was basically left alone uh, fighting with my enemy, right? Or my <laughs> sleeping with your enemy, as, as they say, right? So then I find, well, uh, they, find, they fired me, then I, well, we went to, to trial, and Oof. in parallel, I started a new company, which was uh -huh. called Plan B, which was a <laughs> very, very fitting name. <laughs> exactly. Right? The name was easy, right? So, and it was basically the same. The, the, the business was growing like crazy. So in, in, in two years, we went from zero to 15 million euros in revenues, right? So I, there was something there. So we started, again, a gift experience company called Plan B. And then that one, I sold it to the Barcelona Group, the mm -hmm. um, tourism group here in Spain, uh, three, three years later. And that's when, right then, I met Xavi, um, who had started this tech company who was basically helping publishers, but mm -hmm. he needed someone helping him with the operations part, the business part of everything, right? So he, he, was, he had been coding for a few months, and that was about it, right? So I said, listen, I can help you. I, have, I just sold my company, so I have some spare time. Uh, so I said, oh, I'll come to my office, and I was like, okay, I'll come. So soon it turned from, oh, I'll drop by every now and then to a full-time job, right? Mm -hmm. And that was 2012, and yeah, it's been seven years, eight wow. years now. So. Amazing. So it started almost as an advisor, and then kind of graduated into, into the full-time uh, yeah. uh, role. Um, and, and just for a little bit of background, my name is, is Scott Mackin. I'm the chief commercial officer of One Cowork, uh, one of the fastest-growing uh, co-working companies here in Spain. We're actually about to launch our third location. Uh, and today's talk is all about sales, specifically sales for startups. So this is a very relevant space uh, that we could probably all uh, gain some value and some insights from. So, so basically, maybe just to start Start us off. Um, you know, why why is sales so critical, especially for startups in the early stage or the growth stage of their life cycle? Uh, first of all, uh, a big uh, salute to those of you that work for yourselves and start your own companies. I don't have the guts yet, but someday. Mm -hmm. 
so sales for startups is <clears throat> not just essential, but critical. What happens is when you have your own solution and, and you try something new and you build this lovely product or solution, it sort of takes, takes over you, right? Um, for the want of a better word, it's almost narcissistic. So you can get a little bit lost in your product, and it's fair because it's your idea, it's, it's fantastic. But if you don't think of how you're going to sell your product, it's not just the go-to-market, but actually have a structured plan in terms of how you're going to sell your product and create those revenues. You may get rejected by some uh, companies that you're looking for them to fund you. So it's the way to guarantee uh, funding, one way to guarantee funding is to show revenue streams, and that is sales. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Juan, and maybe you can speak to your experience too with Marfiel, um, how, how you implemented sales, a sales culture early on. Wow, yeah, it's a <laughs> difficult one. I, uh, I don't know. So at the beginning, basically, and, and as, as you were saying, right, so sales is, I mean, it's what keeps the company going, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you can raise so much money from investors, and if you don't sell at some point, they will stop financing you, right? So if you want to run a business long term, you need to sell. That's as simple as that, right? So. At the beginning, in our case, of course, we, well, I don't know how familiar you are with Marfield, but basically we sell, we're a B2B product for uh, online publishers, right? We help publishers basically uh, engage, monetize, and create their mobile uh, pages, right? So it was, it's kind of a pretty technical product to sell, and it's a hard sell for, uh, or it's, it's a hard decision for our publishers, our clients, because for them it's a big change, right? So when you need, we thought at the beginning, we thought, okay, we need the technical, we need the smart people, whatever, so we hired a few MBAs. And that, that, that was a bad idea, right? Because all of them had their own preconceptions. Oh, no, no, this is not going to work. You need to do this, you need to do that. And it, it was terrible, right? So I, any one of the original Marfillers, we could go and sell easily. For them, it was like everything was complex. The product was never re ready. So it was, it, was, you know, it was a bad call. They either left or we let them go. And, and then we kind of started again from scratch. Then we decided, we thought, okay, we are... Uh, we're selling to publishers, so why don't we hire uh, young graduates from, um, you know, um, publishing schools or, or um, reporters, basically, yeah. right? And see if they, you know, maybe they get along better with these guys. So, and that turned out to be a good decision, right? That that worked much better because they were younger, they didn't have all these preconceptions, so they were mm, way more flexible in terms of understanding how to sell. So they, they, we could train them our way. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way, right? And that started working very, very well, and and that turned out to be like a very good decision. Back then I was basically the this VP of sales, um, among many other things, right? So, um, and I was selling myself, right? The big part of my time I was selling myself, right? And that helped us create the product, uh, the product to, the, to the market needs and mm -hmm. all that. And, and little by little, now we have a much bigger sales organization, of course. Now we have, in sales, we have around 40 people right now, right? Wow. So it's, yeah, so it's, now it's way more structured. So we have, well, I don't know if, I guess we'll go into the detail later, but yes, now we have specialized teams on different phases of the sales process. And yeah, well, well let's, let's stay with you on that, on that note, because I think that's a really key point, is with startups, it's, it's the timing, right? Is, is the product ready to put a sales team behind it? And, and up until that point, the founders are the, are the sales team, yeah. right? Uh, so at, at what point did, did Marfil say, okay, now I think we're ready to bring in the, the MBAs, that didn't work out, so we went a little more junior, people yeah. with ad sales, publishing experience, um, but what, you know, how did you actually think of like the organizational chart and, and did you kind of build the map of what you want and the key pieces or did you just kind of let it organically develop from the ground up? In terms of sales? You mean? Yeah, the sales, the sales organization at Marfield. Yeah, so I read and I really highly recommend the book uh, by Jason Lenkin. Um, well, there's two books um, and basically we followed that, you know, we followed Which that. Which book? Um, both of them, uh, Predictable Revenue. And the other one, frankly speaking, I forgot the title, but it's, it's more or less, one is the evolution of the other, okay. right? So, but predictable revenue is kind of my Bible, right? Okay. We, we followed it like step by step, basically, right? So, so we have a team of BDs, business developers, who basically source for uh, leads. They look for leads, uh, potential prospects, candidates to become clients. They warm, warm them up. And once that lead is, is hot, is warm enough, for us, warm enough means that the person we're talking to is a decision maker or mm -hmm. is relevant to the decision. Um, they fit within our sweet spot in terms of size, and they're interested, they want to know more, right? Sure. Then 
they pass it on to, account, to the account executives. And, and then we have a team of 12 account executives, I believe. And what they do, basically, their job is to close the business, mm -hmm. right? uh, to close the deal. And then once the deal is closed, uh, it goes into the go live process, the go live team, which is uh, there's some technical, uh, you know, there's some integrations that needs to be done. Um, but then it's more a technical process, right? Okay. And of course, we have team leads, we have managers. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of a way more structured than it used to be. Of course. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's, let's come back to that in a bit because I want to see the evolution of how that unfolded. Um, but Shruti, tell us about your, your sales team uh, or specifically sure. the, the Barcelona office, right? Yeah. Um, so in the Barcelona office, we have roughly about um, 380 people that I mentioned, and out of which 220 people are purely commercial teams. So we have new business teams that actually create new business. Mm -hmm. And the account management teams or account strategist teams who you know, try and get incremental business from our existing customers and take care of the customers. So um, very similar. We are going to start with the BDR team from a career pathing for leads. But another important investment we've made recently is we are using a part of our own technology in terms of artificial intelligence to um, automate leads. So lead nurturing, uh, trying to find leads, et cetera. It was from a team in Barcelona that actually put this together, so I'm very happy about that team. And once you go through the whole process, like warm leads, mm -hmm. nurture leads, it goes to the sales team, mm -hmm. they qualify, and integration, because we're in a similar industry as you. And then you know it goes to the account strategies. Okay, so this when when I hear lead nurturing and I hear uh, automating leads, I hear sure. marketing. I don't hear sales. Uh, so so is is there a marketing oh, team? Sure, <laughs> sure. So or do we not say that word up here? Let's let's talk about some truths here. One tip for startups is yes, marketing is very important. Don't put all your money in just marketing, right? Sales is a function where you need to head on convince customers to get your product. No matter how warm the lead is, mm -hmm. even though a lot of customers today pretty much know what they want, by the way, they're very ahead in terms of what's available in the market, you will need to really face the customer and convince them about mm -hmm. your product. And don't wait for your product to be perfect. I'm sure you all have great product development teams, but it has to be a commercially viable product. Yeah. The, these are two different things, a product that's perfect and a product that's commercially viable. Mm -hmm. And um, it's evolving. The relationship between sales and marketing is right. evolving. And it is definitely both are very necessary. But make sure you divide enough into hiring hungry, result-oriented salespeople uh, who want to make money for your company. Yeah, no, definitely. And, you know, I think, I think Criteo is a bit more evolved than, than most of the startups, sure. the, the founders or, or the employees are in this room. Um, but it, we can look into the future and we can say, okay, this is how they structured that, that team. What are some of the, um, the metrics that, that Criteo uses to, to evaluate what's a, an, a marketing qualified lead versus mm -hmm. what's ready for sales and what's being passed along? What, what are you guys measuring at Criteo? So um, it depends on the market. It depends on the product or solution we want. A uh, marketing qualified lead is pretty much that they have enough number of unique visitors, for mm -hmm. example, or they have enough number of transactions on their website, et cetera. Okay. And so it's very quantitative. It's, it's, it's very, very clear this becomes a, yes, a yes. MQL. Because you don't want, you don't want you're, if you're paying a salesperson, you want as much as possible their time not to be wasted in trying to call the wrong prospects. Mm -hmm. So qualified prospects is a very important uh, part of your, of your sales process. And then you have the sales qualified leads, so mm -hmm. saying that, okay, this, uh, this lead is good, it's, it's strong enough for me mm -hmm. to sell into, and that's your sales qualified lead. And sometimes they convert, sometimes they don't. So you have specific standardized conversion metrics, industry standards, in terms of what uh, an MQL should convert into, how many MQLs should convert into SQLs, and so on and so forth, yeah. into deals. Okay. Basically. Okay, that makes sense. And and yeah. Juan, how how is this process happening at, at Marfield? What metrics are you tracking? What KPIs do you look at? Well, we we're crazy about metrics. So we we basically track everything, right? Mm -hmm. So it seems from the top of the funnel, like um, how many how many leads we or potential leads we give to the BDs, and then how do they turn or whether the conversion metrics into a confirmer opportunity? How many? Which, so we track how many calls are made per day per BD, how many emails are sent. Um, we shadow calls, we record calls, so we make sure everyone like it's 
knows the product, sells mm -hmm. the product the right way, et cetera, et cetera, right? Then when it goes into the account executives, so the same, right? So we know if a lead comes, we also go a lot to events. So we differentiate the lead source. Did it come from an event? Did it mm -hmm. come from a call call? Did it come from, is an inbound lead, et cetera, et cetera? And each one of them has their own path towards becoming a client, right? And so we, we measure the cost per source, everything, right? But basically, um, everything, the time to, um, you know, the time it takes from a lead to become, for, for since uh, time from conversion from lead to confirm opportunity, from confirm opportunity to client. What are, what are the, I mean, for, from our field, what is the average sales life cycle? How long does that process take? It, it depends a lot on the size of the publisher, um, but in, in our sweet spot, it's a couple of months. Months? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a couple of months. Um, yeah, yeah. And from first interaction to introducing the project, From first contact yeah. to signing the car. First contact to signing the deal, it's a couple of months. Yeah. yeah. Some publishers, especially the bigger ones, I mean, the, probably the edge case, and now it's uh, one of our top customers, and it, they've been with us for, I believe, three years, but it took us two years to convince them, right? Wow. So it was basically like a relationship thing, and they were like, listen, yes, we like your product, but we're not prepared to work with you, we'll let you know, right? So we kept meeting them, whatever, and then one day they call us like, let's go, right? That's probably the, the longest case we've had, but, but yeah. But. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that you, you, you still are engaging in, so this is, it's been a few years since I've been, been on the phones, uh, but you said your, your team is doing cold calls, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so um, back, back in my day of smile and dial, uh, we used to try and hit 100 calls a day. We were, we were, in, uh, we were in IT staffing and consulting yeah. and, and augmented labor. Um, 100 calls a day was a lot. That's a, yeah, 100 is a lot. So, so what, what, what are, what's, a, what's a normal day for, a, let's say, a junior level salesperson? How many calls are they making? How many emails are they sending? Okay, um, thing is, even though we're still doing call calls, it's now a small portion of our, of our sales efforts, right? or, 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 or of our lead generation efforts. I think it's 6%, if I'm not mistaken, right? That means there's a lot of other things going on mm -hmm. that convert way better, right? So we have an email automation tool that basically warms up leads and whenever a lead is ready to go, or, uh, we have different parameters like, okay, if this happens, that happens, that happens, now is the moment to call the guy, right? Yeah. And then it's, it's a call call, but it's not really a call call. The guy already knows about Marfield, right? And then the conversion rate is way better, right? If not, of course, you get a lot of people like, hey, I'm, why are you calling me? You're so, right. I'm so busy. This is not the right moment, right? So, yeah. Literally, call calls is, is so it's a hard sale. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, you're interrupting their their day. Basically, to, exactly. Yeah. Whatever, even if he's playing tennis. Yeah. Interrupt. Well, it's good to hear that those that the percentage has gone down. Back then, we just plow through that and just keep yeah. keep dialing. Um, Can but, I just add to that? Yeah, absolutely. So, if if you are a startup, early stage startup, please invest in LinkedIn Premium. Uh, why? Not because I work for LinkedIn, I love the company. <laughs> you still have uh, shares? Because it works. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with the LinkedIn premium account, you get a LinkedIn sales navigator option. So this is your own little online social based um, CRM. Sort of a CRM. <laughs> I'm not officially supposed to say that, but yes, right? <laughs> so you can. That's because that's the ex LinkedIn in you saying, yeah, oh, it's not a CRM. I'm sorry, it just doesn't get out of my system. It's hard. So um, you have your own basically view of all the companies you want to target. You can filter the way you want. You can nurture the way you want. You have a limit of in mails you can send a day. So social selling is sort of the new norm, and which is why, you know, I'm not surprised your company has reduced your cold calling to such a low percent. In Criteria, we're still doing a lot of cold calling, but we're getting there in terms of social selling. Um, and this is very important. Mm -hmm. So you also have LinkedIn Learning as a part of your LinkedIn Premium account where you can actually learn sales methodologies, how to sell into different companies, how to sell into executives versus influencers versus different types of people within the company. So please invest in that. It doesn't cost much. Mm -hmm. But on to Criteo. Of course. Um, <laughs> staying, staying, staying with the same theme, though, of tools. Okay, so LinkedIn Navigator, LinkedIn yeah. Premium, for sure, given. Sure. Um, what are, what's the sales technology stack at Criteo? What, do you, what tools are you guys using? Honestly, we use Salesforce CRM. Okay. Um, it is uh, right now the number one in the industry. It also plugs into a lot of different applications. Salesforce partners with a lot of different mm -hmm. applications. Mm -hmm. We are starting to look at gaming. We are starting to look at AI applications that are going to integrate with Salesforce to sort of 
pretty much tell us what is the best time to contact a particular lead. Mm -hmm. And we're also building a lot of in-house tools. So primarily Salesforce CRM, I would say, and we have a lot of in-house tools. Okay. Because we have a pretty strong R&D team and product team, mm -hmm. and they are building things that fit us. Yeah, and Juan, oh, sorry. Sorry. No, but if you're a startup, just go buy a license. Well, Don't that's the thing is, is, um, is startups are definitely faced at this stage yeah. with the, the biggest major decision is that CRM, which yeah. platform do you go with, right? And Salesforce is a lot of power behind it. And the question I think is, do you need that all at once? Is it too much when you're at that early stage? Pro probably, no, definitely not. However, at some point you're gonna, you're gonna, you will want to move to Salesforce. Correct. And the, that transition is a, you know, a nightmare. That's a pain, I mean, that's a terrible so, pain. So Marfield's using Salesforce? We are now, yeah, well, we've been using it for maybe four years now. Okay. Uh, what was the legacy product before? I think it was Pipedrive, Pipe Drive. if I'm not mistaken. Okay. That's a very is, popular one with startups, a, It's sure. super popular, it's way cheaper, it's mm -hmm. super easy to set up. Yeah, it's, it's just it's, columns, right? Exactly, drag and drop columns, super easy, right? At the beginning, Salesforce has so many things that it's it's it's, it's overwhelming. overwhelming right? Yeah, it's overwhelming, absolutely. absolutely. But you're gonna most likely you will want to move to Salesforce at some point. Mm -hmm. And then you have to. So the question now is, okay, do I invest now in Salesforce, even though it's you know you're, you're basically buying uh, you know a, a transatlantic uh, Ferrari or plane whatever, <laughs> and you just need now a mo motorbike or a bicycle, right? But when you want to move from one to the other, that's a pain. Yeah. So, so you have to be ready for uh, an implementation and, and a transition, right? Yeah. I mean, this, it, it, it has to go through the entire organization pretty much. So when's the moment that you do that? In our, well, I think you, you feel it, right? At some point, it's like, OK, this is it, right? There's, uh, because you st then you start needing, like, exactly right. as you were saying, integrations with third parties. Or you're starting functionalities that the other system doesn't support. You're, so at some point, it's like, if you want to grow big, uh, you need it, right? Mm -hmm. Also, it's not my case, but I've heard some, of, some friends who are like, OK, tell me what you're doing with Salesforce that you cannot do with A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. And maybe, and, and more and more SaaS companies are, and the small CRMs or smaller or less popular CRMs, they're getting more and more sophisticated. So it is also true that maybe it's not the case anymore, but in our in our experience, it was kind of easy. Also, because on sales, everybody uses Salesforce, right? So people will know how to use it, and you, you will hire a new whatever, CMO, or a new VP of sales. Right. And, and the guy's like, oh, but we need Salesforce, because this is what I know. This is how I can get my reports. This is how I can connect. So it's kind of the standard in the industry. Everybody uses that. Mm -hmm. So that's also another selling point that they have. Find something that can easily port into Salesforce. That's awesome. probably the mm -hmm. second option is find something that can easily be transferred to Salesforce. No, definitely. Sure. Definitely. It seems to be the industry standard. And then it, as far as attracting uh, key talent, they're going to want to come with something familiar with that they know that yeah. they can use from yeah. day one. Yeah. Um, in, in Marfield's case specifically, how long was the, was the how painful was the tra implementation <laughs> process? How long it, did it, it take? Was, it was painful. So first thing we did, we, we selected a few consultants to, to work on that. Mm -hmm. And the, our favorite one was like, oh, do you have some references in the world? Yeah, I've worked with this, this, and that other company. And one of those companies, I, am, I used to be an, an investor, a business angel in that company. So I called the guy, like, hey, um, I heard you work, you work with these guys. Would you recommend them? He's like, definitely not. Like, All right. <laughs> so I'm not working with It's good to have honest yeah, feedback. So, so, we, so we ended up doing, our, doing it ourselves. Really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. With Salesforce support online, yeah, helping yeah, you configure yeah. the some platform. Yeah, yeah, Salesforce support, but a lot of, yeah. yeah. At the end, it's... Exporting and importing, if you, in a way, it's, I mean, being a tech company is not that difficult. And right. at, the thing is, it's, it's not that we are smarter than other people, but we need, we need it, you need to explain them exactly how you use it, mm -hmm. what you use everything for, and how you want to set it up. Mm -hmm. So at the end, it's like, okay, it's, it's, it was more complex, kind of making them understand what we needed, how we were right. using it than just doing it ourselves. Right? Yeah, and I think, I think that's a, a very common problem a lot of companies will face at a certain point. They reach a ceiling of, what, of when they, the current CRM isn't really cutting it, and they need to evolve to Salesforce, and then it's that moment that they need to worry about the implementation and, and planning that, having internal stakeholders and external support for that. Um, be, beyond Salesforce and LinkedIn, any other tools uh, or, or platforms that you're leveraging for sales? Yeah, we, I mean, that's not familiar anymore, but yeah, I think we use uh, Pardot, which is part of Salesforce. That's yes. part of Salesforce. It's the marketing yes. automation yes, platform. Yeah. We used to use Yesware for tracking emails. Mm -hmm. I think we're now using something different, but I don't remember what it, we're using. Um, I don't remember what tool we're using for recording calls. But um, yeah, but I think those is kind of the basics. Yeah. Nice. Uh, nice. Any if other you're tools? in a consumer-based startup, use Facebook. 
Like I know if you're, I don't know, if you're a salon, for example, mm -hmm. Facebook is just simply one way of revenue. Yeah, so and, and they're starting to roll revenue. out, they're starting to roll out Instagram uh, yeah. sales tools as well as WhatsApp sales tools as totally. well. Uh, we see a big push with uh, WhatsApp for sales, WhatsApp for business. Yes. It's true. Some people find it aggressive, though. Um, yeah. Personally, myself. Well, yeah, well, WhatsApp is a very personal platform, right? That's it's where you talk to your friends, your exactly, family. It's not exactly. really necessarily yeah, work. Yeah. Uh, but if you are a B2C company or if you are, let's say, a small business working as a salon or a yeah. spa or something, people want that, yeah, you know, true. to book an appointment or things like yes. that. Um, so, no, it, it'll be interesting to see how these, how these tools evolve. Um, okay, just shifting focus back to... Um, you know, we want to provide practical kind of best, best practices and, and engagement, things that you guys can actually take with you. Um, let's, let's come back to training, okay? You, you've built a sales culture, obviously, in both organizations, very sales, sales heavy. Um, what's the training process like? How do you onboard people and get them integrated into your, into your culture? Start with you, Shruti. Well, um, it's almost immersion in some sense. So um, we try and hire people uh, in waves. So when they do come in, um, in just terms of the company training, you have your standard company training, you have your cultural training, and then you have your sales training. Mm -hmm. We are working with a new how, provider. How long is that the whole thing? A couple of weeks, Which is okay. give or take. So there are different methodologies for sales. And at some stage, you adopt something and use it until it becomes natural, but we do go through a training process mm -hmm. respective to that methodology that we want. So we're trying to use a new vendor now for Criteo. Okay. Um, and we'll see how that goes. So you bring some external support for training yes. and onboarding. Oh, yes. Interesting. We have a team inside too, mm -hmm. but let's call the experts, yeah. right? We are not experts in sales. We sort of are, but right. try to get in the experts who's, whose job it is to actually come and train people. Oh, that's really interesting. There are a lot of methodologies. Yeah, and what about Marfield? How, how do you onboard new sales, team, new sales reps into your team? So now we have a similar process, pretty, very structured. Um, at the beginning, of course, it was like, okay, here's your phone, here's your computer, go sell something, right? <laughs> now it's more, way more complex. So even if we hire uh, someone in the US who have a small office in New York, uh, we fly them here, so they get to know the team, they get to know the product, and then it's very, in our case, it takes three weeks, the okay. whole onboarding process. And during that period for the sales team, so what they do is they sit, uh, well, there are some classes or like uh, pitches on Marfield culture, mm -hmm. what we do, sure. et cetera, right? Our size, our top customers, et cetera, et cetera. Also, we have, a, that's also interesting, we have a, an internal Wikipedia, we call it Atenea, where there's everything's like documented, so they can also work on, you know, read functionalities, why we do this, why do we do that, et cetera, et cetera. Then they sit with different teams, so they understand the whole process from, from no matter what position of sales they have, they, they, they learn from BDs until closing, and then they go live, so they understand the full process. And we also do a lot of role plays, a lot of shadowing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, so they shadow the first, you know, the, the, the more senior guys. And then also, every new hire has a, it's a buddy, right? We call him a buddy, right? So it's someone who's like more or less on your level. A mentor, who sure. You can relate to, they yeah. take you to lunch or whatever, and they help you around, right? Also like. Simple things like yeah, no, how smart. to get an apartment in Barcelona, where to live. Those things, that if, especially if you bring people from outside, right? So it's, it's, it's important to, to work them hand in hand, right? Yeah. So they, they are lost in a new city. So. No, definitely. There's, there's more on board than just the work aspect. There's yeah. the, the life aspect. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I wanted, there's something I really want to cover because this is a, this is a, a, a process that gets tripped up, trips up a lot of startups, is the commission structure. Uh -huh. How do you build a sustainable uh, and scalable uh, incentive plan? Uh, Shruti, do you want to start how Criteo does it? Sure, so surprisingly, many big companies also get that wrong. Yeah. Uh, you need to find the best balance in terms of um, having the revenues, having the right rewarding system, having the right incentives versus profitability. So if you're trying to sell a product that is worth 1K, you do want to be spending commission of 3K or 5K, right? right. So you have to find the balance. Um, in in Criteo, we have sales operations whose job is to find the right mm -hmm. commission plan based on historical data, et cetera. If you're an early stage startup, uh, my recommendation is try with a percentage of the sale as commission. Try with the who? A percentage of the sale. Okay. So that's sort of safe, you know, if, if somebody's selling 10 grand or 100 grand, you're still, you know, sort of rewarding them with a percentage of the sale. And that's easy. If you have the right hungry person uh, with you, then they will sell. 
Yeah, well, if you have the right person, they can really take advantage of that. Do you put caps on commissions? Uh, we do. We have an accelerator up to a certain point. Mm -hmm. And after that, we don't have an accelerator. So if you achieve more than 100%, let's say every dollar you close is worth $2. Mm -hmm. But once you cross, say, 200% or 150%, depending on the role you're in, then it's $1 is equal to $1. But that really pushes your team to at least to get that To get that next level. Yeah. 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 What about you, John? And we how have a lot of people that made a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> last quarter. Uh, how, how does the incentive structure work at, at Marfield? So we try to keep it first very simple, mm -hmm. right? Because at the end of the day, if you, over, if you make things over complex, I right. mean, people will spend more time trying to figure out how to make more money than really selling, right? So in our case, we try to keep it super simple. At the beginning, it was as you were saying. So, um, upon, so af after a certain threshold, when they pass that, then they, they get a percentage on their mm -hmm. sales. As simple as that, right? Of course, the, there were triggers depending on if they were reaching from 60 to 80%, from 80 to 100%. No, I think it's from, we had it from 80 to 120%, and then above 120, there was a bigger trigger. And in our case, we have it uncapped, right? There's a funny story. I remember once one of our sales guys, he did a fantastic job. He, he closed like one quarter, you know, a lot of very important deals. He made a ton of money, right? So he made more money on commissions. Well, I don't know if I could say that, but okay. Let's say he made a ton of money. Let's put it that way, right? And the guy was like, he came to me after, you know, getting the money in his bank. He was like, I wasn't sure you were going to pay me that much, right? Because I said, why not? It's like, hey, this uncap, the rules are rules. Uh, yeah. Hey, you, you had a great quarter. I mean, good on you, right? So, of course, it's, it's I, get, I get that when you reach your size at some point, you need to, everything, you need to have everything more like in balance and everything. And in a way, we're in a way going to transitioning into that. Now, it's maybe less aggressive. It's still uncapped, but we also promote, because the, the way we had a structure, if you have, you could have a great quarter, and basically, mm -hmm. you could basically, you know, ride that way for the rest of the year in a way, right? If you reach the minimum. Now we've, you know, we, we incentivize more the hitting their goals every single quarter. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a tricky balance, right? And it it's changes as you balance. grow, right? Yeah. As your yeah. company grows and evolves, you have to change that. Well, we're definitely, uh, unfortunately, ra uh, running out of time here, uh, but maybe we can have a, a quick closing thought that, that you would give for, um, let's say, new entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs, where they, where they should go and, and where they should focus their efforts as far as becoming better at sales and building a sales culture in their company. Uh, any Closing thoughts, we'll start with you, Chuan. Um, anytime is good for sales, and a lot, I know a lot of engineers kind of, or especially in tech companies, they look at the sales department like an inferior department in a way, mm -hmm. but we have to think that without sales, as we were saying at the beginning, uh, nobody gets paid, right? So sales is super important, and also for your personal life, right? Um, I mean, selling skills, it's important in, in your day-to-day, -day. Uh, so don't, don't, I mean, Pay attention to sales. It's, it's as important as your product, right? So very rarely you have such a great product that sells by itself, right? Of course, if it's B2C, maybe it's more marketing than, than pure sales, but it's, it's super important. And Barcelona, we're also saying that at the beginning, we're, getting, we have, we're having more and more talent on sales, mm -hmm. on SaaS sales. Definitely. So take advantage of that. Barcelona is a great, you know, great spot, a great magnet for talent, a lot of people coming in. Or we, you know, so take advantage of that, and, and yeah, the opportunity is there. So go, go and yeah, go and get it. Nice, thank you. And Shruti, your final thoughts? Don't think about just Spain. There's a whole world out there that you can sell into. I think the first <laughs> thing you think about when you start up in Spain is to sell in Spain. You have the technology. Use the social media. It's there. It's connected. Um, and always be closing, ABC. ABC, <laughs> yeah. always be closing. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time and for thank joining you. us here at Startup Grind. Thanks a lot. Yeah, round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.